Go ahead with the announcements. We have a couple of small things to cover today. First of which is, as was just mentioned, please fill out the survey. It is approximately 10 minutes. Feedback from the survey will be used to, uh, to modify this course. So there's, if there's enough recurring feedback that we hear, then we will make changes to this course. So your feedback will have a direct impact on your own learning experience. So definitely um, take the five to 10 minutes and get that filled out by Thursday. Also on Thursday, we will be having our first catch-up day, which means we'll have a little bit of extra time to just work with TAs, ask any questions you might have about assignment two or any general coding questions. And additionally, at the very start of that class, we're gonna have Mike Northrup from the company team talk to us about uh, the apprenticeship process for a little bit. So that'll be about 30 minutes of the time. And then the rest of the time will just be with your TAs. Um, you can take that time if you're ahead of the game and you can already demo assignment two, that'd be a perfect time to demo that. But if not, you can get help from some of your TAs. And uh, while we're talking about assignment demos, ensure that you schedule time to demo with your TAs. So you have to be proactive here. When you turn in your assignment on Canvas, the first thing to do is to send a direct message to one or both of your TAs and let them know, hey, I've turned in my assignment. I, I think it's ready for a demo. Uh, if I can meet at, during studio time or I could meet during one of these office hours, either time would be great. And they will be able to uh, uh, schedule you in for a, a really short, five minute demo, talk about your code a little bit. And then after that conversation is done, you will be all set with assignment two, provided that the assignment is completed. Okay, and um, finally, we have no class next Monday for Juneteenth. So we will not be meeting um, next Monday. So if you come to class on the 19th, we will not be here. <laughs> all right uh those are all my announcements i'm going to be meeting with ta group one today so please check the pinned comment in staff chat tas and i will see y'all shortly thanks gary thanks colin okay so tonight we are talking about modules um and uh, I've got a uh, couple other announcement slides, then we'll get into the lecture. I will give you a little bit of encouragement um, because uh, your studio tonight is a non-coding studio. You're gonna be uh, talking about kind of, um, you know, when you run up against things like imposter syndrome and just anxiety and fear and um, start doubting yourself, um, you know, where, where do you go to draw? Um, on things that can give you more confidence and remind you how far you've come and what you're doing. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of encouragement from my own experience um, before uh, sending you off to studio. All right. So I believe Colin just gave all of these uh, announcements. Um, yeah, about this survey and the great assignment deadline and all that. Um, this one, uh, if you missed it last time, um, I have a intro video for graded assignment number two uh, that will walk you through the instructions and the starter code, help you get oriented, and then um, help you out with some uh, inside knowledge on things to watch out for that tend to trip people up. So I recommend you watch that. Um, yeah, oh, I have bullet points, look at that, okay. And then of course, uh, tomorrow evening, there are uh, in-person meetups um, in Kansas City and Philadelphia uh, in St. Louis. Let Colin know um, if you are interested in having another one and they'll get that scheduled. Okay, so um, modules. The idea behind modules is just having multiple files. Um, that's really all it is. So we're gonna talk about that, um, a little bit of the terminology with it, and then I will, um, show you the different syntax you can use for when you are 
um, just exporting a single item from a file versus um, you know, multiple items. And then uh, I'm gonna go a little bit past what's in your book to show you what uh, the professionals tend to do, which is to use deconstruction, um, which is a, a syntax with um, modern JavaScript. And so that'll give you a little bit of uh, options on how you might want to use uh, imported functions and objects and such. Okay, um, so the concept here is just getting organized, splitting your code out, um, because you know big applications can have millions of lines of code, and you you know imagine if that was all in one file, right? That would be insane. So modules allow you to split it into multiple files, and that means it's going to be more organized. It's going to be easier to navigate and find what you're looking for. Um, it makes it reusable. You can have shared code in one spot that gets used by a lot of different files. Um, and you can actually have modules uh, packaged up into like a library that can be shared with other people. In fact, uh, we use those kinds of things all the time. Um, so here's some of the terminology you'll hear around this, um, module, package, library, and dependency. So a module is a single file with exported code. A package is a group of modules, um, and sometimes it's a you know packages of packages of packages of mod modules, um, depending on how big it is. A library is kind of a term that just means um, here's some here's a bunch of code that you can use, but it almost always refers to stuff that's out there that's been published uh, for other people to use. Um, and then the term dependency really refers to a library or package that has actually been installed into your application. Um, and you may notice, in, even in Replit, every time you uh, use, if you put an import statement in for read line sync so that you can use the input dot question, um, the first time you hit the run button after that, you'll notice that you know in the console there that it's like saying it's installing some things, right? And then if you go over and you actually check these files, you can see you know that it's been added to the dependencies down here. So, um, those are some of the terms that I think are helpful to know. And then of course, the last two terms, uh, which we'll be using heavily tonight, are import and export. What does that mean, right? So when you have things that you want to share to make available to other files from where they're defined, that's where you actually export them from. And then in the other file where you want to use it, you have to import it. Um, and it really is literally kind of like this diagram where you have an export statement statement like at the bottom of your uh, file where the definition is, and then you put an import statement at the top of the file where you want to use it. Um, so let's get into uh, some of the syntax that you use. There are some you know different ways to do things. So we're going to kind of cover it one at a time for like the the way you can kind of think about it and um, really. Uh, when you're exporting with a single item, you can make the syntax very simple. So one item um, would be like, you know, maybe you just have one uh, object in a variable or you have one function in a, in a file that a module that needs to be exported. You can just point to it directly with module.exports. You don't need to have a whole object, but we'll look at that in a minute. Um, so let's look at this example. I've got um, a uh, function called validate input that takes like, and this would be a, a circumstance where like you wanna, you wanna check for why or in, like yes or no, right? Um, so you give maybe an array of you know, possible uh, valid answers, and then you have a message for like ask, asking them the question. And then you use input that question to get the response and then validate it. You have this while loop. And just as long as they are saying something other than why or, or no, you know, why or in, we're going to keep asking them over and over again until they finally get it right. And then we will uh, return that response. So this is just a little function that's one size fits all for those kinds of circumstances. And you might, you know, use it in multiple places in your uh, program. Um, so if I just have this in a file and I just want to um, export the one file, I can actually do that uh, just by setting it uh, equal directly. So essentially what's happening here is you have an anonymous export um, so you just you just send it out directly, and then when you get to the other side and you're importing it, you can kind of call it whatever you want to. Um, and so in this example, uh, I can just say, okay, point you know point this uh, module.exports to validate uh, input. That is the only thing that I need to export. So just point right to it, and that's as, that's as simple as it is. 
So um, this will go at the bottom of the file again. Um, and then when you import, uh, we will, oh yes, I did have one more thing. There we go. Yeah, it points to the original function. So uh, when we import, we can actually um, call it whatever we want to. Um, and so in this example, I have, you know, validate, I've given it a different name. I've basically set an alias that just says, okay, whatever's coming from my other file. And let's say that that was in a file called common.js. Um, I would just say, you know, require that file. And then just whatever's coming back from module.exports, that's what I want um, validate to represent. So in this case, validate is, is going to be pointing then if we go back directly to validate input, I've just given it a slightly different name. Um, and then somewhere down here, I can actually use it. Um, and I can say, you know, let play again, and then um, call the function. Oh, I have bullet points. Gosh, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> Doing everything out of order. Uh, yeah, so um, you use const um, to represent, uh, with, with the alias that represents the item, use the require keyword, and then you give it the file path. So that's what's happening up here, okay. Um, so there's the alias uh, for the function. And then here is where I'm actually using it directly and just saying, let play again, equal validate. And then I give it Y or N as the possible valid options. And then I say, this is the message I want to display when we ask, would you like to play again? Y or N, right? Um, so this is a great little function because I could use it in a lot of different places for different things where I need this kind of validation. Um, all right. So let's look at an example of this. Um, we can come over here. I've got uh, a few uh, simple things here where we're gonna just like import something from contact.js. Well, in order to import it, I need to actually go over to contact.js and I need to uh, export it, right? So what I have here is um, some basic con contact information for launch code. Uh, nothing spy related at the moment, um, but... <laughs> Um, um, so, uh, yeah, contact information in, in an object with key value pairs. I've got a uh, business hours object with all the days of the week and those hours. And then um, I have a function that just is going to format business hours in a way that I want to display it. So it's going to loop through every day in, in you know, every key in here and um, access that and then just as long as it's not closed, it's going to display it. Um, and then it'll return that string. So the last function I've got here is print organ, you know, org info, which is um, just going to format things. It's going to grab some information from the contact and it's going to actually uh, then add on at the end here. And this is all in one big template, literally you'll notice, right? So I'm, I'm using this so that I can kind of literally lay this out the way that I want it to be. And then um, it'll include the, the, the text that comes from here where I had to do a little bit of extra work to build it the way that I wanted it. So that's it. And this is the only one I really ultimately need, but it's just that this was depending on all of these to do what it needed to do. So I can just you know do the module.exports, set it equal to print org info here, and then when we get over into index, I can uh, import it right here. So uh, let's go here. Wow. Import the function from contact.js that prints launch codes organizational information. So this is gonna be very straightforward. And I can, again, I can call this whatever I want. I'm gonna make it a const um, so it can't be overwritten. And I'm gonna say print LC info. Um, so I'm gonna make it a little more specific, right? And then I'll just say require, and then I will just get the path that goes to um, contact.js, all right. And then um, that's it. So now this points directly to, it says that it's a function. Um, it's using this alias, right? Uh, and then if we actually go over here, you know, we know that it's pointing to this function right here. So uh, now we, all we have to do is call it and I'm gonna call it using the name that exists in this file, the alias that we have. So we can run it. And we see everything uh, that came out of that template literal. We have, um, you know, all the basic con 
contact information. And then we have the result of that other function that gives us this, you know, nicely formatted stuff with only the days and times where it's, you know, open for business, right? Okay. So, and I uh, do not claim that those uh, values are accurate um, <laughs> because the building was closed uh, like permanently for like three years back when I wrote this. Um, okay, so now let's get back to the slides and talk about what happens when you want to import multiple files from a module. Okay, or not multiple files, I'm sorry, multiple items like functions and objects. Okay, so if you have multiple items, um, you can set, an object as the value of module.exports instead of just pointing directly at something, um, just one thing. And then um, every key would need to be the name you wanna use in the other files. Um, and that can be its original name or it can be uh, an alias, um, but you can just set, set all the keys that way. And then the values will point to whatever items are in this file that are to be exported. And just remember that when you uh, are, uh, exporting functions, you don't put the parentheses on the end because you're not calling them, you're just referencing them, you're pointing to them. Okay, so I've got an example here on the slide. Uh, I've got a get random number function and a round to decimal place function, um, and which is wrong. Sorry about that. Uh, that sh there should be two asterisks there. <laughs> um, and uh, but anyway, I have this module.export. So I can say, okay, uh, I'm going to set an object. I've got key value pairs, get random num, let's just give it the exact same name uh, here, and then we'll just point at it. They have the same name. Here I've got round to desk. That's the alias that I wanna use um, when I use it in the other file, um, but I'm going to point it at this one. So I need to actually say round to decimal place to use the name that's in this file and say, when I'm using this elsewhere, we're gonna call it round to desk, but it's gonna point at round to decimal place here, okay? So these are the options and you don't ever have to do that if you don't want to, you can always use the, the original name, but this is perfectly valid. And um, you're gonna see lots of examples out there in the wild if you're like researching things about, you know, where you see things like this. And um, it's just good to know all the different ways that it can be done uh, because there are variations. Okay, so that's exporting, right? So now we have two things exported, they're in an object. So module.exports is now um, representing an object that has keys and values. So that's important for when we get over to um, the next file. So there's the key alias, and here's um, where we point to the original function. And then when we get over here to uh, importing, we can um, do this a little bit differently because if it's an object, with keys, um, we're gonna need to represent the object kind of like, you know, represent some sort of alias for the module.exports object. And then we can use dot notation to get to the keys. Um, so let's look at this example. I've got that uh, utils file that maybe has those, you know, math functions in it, right? So I'm just gonna call it utils. That's gonna be the alias for the entire module.exports object that I defined. Um, but then when I go to use it, uh, let's say I want to create PyLite, which is you know just rounded to two decimal places. Well, this is where I need to actually use the uh, utils that it stands in for the module.exports object. And then I use dot notation to call the key um, that, rep that represents that function. Um, and then uh, we see that uh, it's going to, you know, round, just round it to like 3.14, right? Um, but there's, so the distinction here is that this is the alias for the entire, mo entire module.exports object that we're using. And this is the alias that I used for that function as the key that was in that object. Um, so, you know, lots of, lots of little moving parts here, but this is a perfectly valid way to do it. And in fact, you guys have done this many, many times already because when you use read line sync and you call it input, if that's what you've been calling it, like I have, you're using input.question, this is exactly what you're doing. You're just using the question function from the input, you know, the read line sync library under the alias of input, okay? So this is the same exact idea. All right, so um, let's do an example of that. And then um, we're going to look at one more uh, type of syntax. Let's come back to here. 
All right. Um, so we have, uh, we need to import from utils.js. And I can't remember if I wrote the uh, export already. Yeah, the export's still here. Okay. So um, I, have, I have created an export object down here at the bottom of the utils file that's in this shared folder. And I've set um, all three functions from up here. I've got a, a rounding function, a random number function, and a format as title case function. If you have like a whole phrase and you want all the words to be cap capitalized. Uh, and I can, uh, excuse me, I can include them all, give them keys. This one I've gone ahead and just given it the same name. These two I've given a slightly different name as aliases for the keys um, to make them a little shorter and that's fine. Uh, something I want to point out real quick before I forget is that um, sometimes when you're looking at all these examples out in the wild, you might actually see uh, it just done like this because that's actually valid with modern JavaScript. And what that means is that the key and the variable name are the same. And so it's a shorthand that you might see other people use. For now, because you're learning this, I recommend that you do it the, you know, explicit way where you just you know say this is the key it's you know because keys are stored as strings it can be a little confusing this is the key this is the value the value actually uh, points to that you know round to desk function um but it, anyway we have all three of these in this object now right so let's go back over to index and um practice uh importing so in this case, I'm going to uh, do kind of like I did on the slide. I'm just going to give it the name utils. It can be anything I want, but it represents that object. Now, here's uh, something that's important. When you're uh, writing the path, you have it has to be a relative path. So in this case, I need to go to the shared folder, which is alongside index.js. So I can just do dot slash to get to that. I don't need to go up. I'm just going sideways. Uh, if I was going up, I would use two dots. Um, so I'll do this and then I will do shared and then I do another slash and there's the utils.js that I want. So I can just tab and add that. And you can leave it like that or you can do it like this. I believe it works both ways in Replit. Um, so uh, there we go. So um, we have a import, now we just need to use it. So I've got this long decimal number and I wanna use the rounding function. Um, and uh, you know, if I'm just doing it this way, I may need to go check and see what the name of that function was. I may not be able to remember, right? So I go back over to the utils file and say, oh yeah, it's round to desk. I need to remember that. I'm making this kind of laborious on purpose because I'm gonna show you a different way to do it in a minute where you don't have to remember. Um, and so uh, we'll just do this. Okay, so I'm gonna console.log and then I'm just gonna call utils.round to desk. And then I'll feed it the long decimal number and uh, I wanna go to three decimal places, so I'll give it three. Okay, um, so let's print that. And we get 43.625, which is exactly right. Um, so that's, that's an example of doing it where you just do everything as a reference to this alias for the entire object with uh, just using those keys with dot notation. Okay. So this last uh, bit, I wanna show you how to um, use a different syntax that actually is called deconstruction. Um, and we're going to, you're gonna learn a lot more about deconstruction when we get to the end of unit one because you're gonna need it for React. Um, and so you'll, you'll see how this is done. Uh, and you're also gonna see a different way to write an import statement with an actual import key keyword, which doesn't work in Replit which is why we're using require instead. Um, but you can, you can do it this way for now. When we get to React, um, you'll be uh, doing, doing it a little differently and that's okay. All right, so this idea of deconstruction um, has multiple benefits to do it this way. One is that you don't need an alias for the entire object. You also don't need dot notation. Instead, you can make it really obvious exactly which items are relevant and which ones you need. And that may not be every single thing that's exported from that file. You may only need one. Um, or two. So uh, I really like this um, a lot. And this is what I, I use professionally um, because it, it makes it really easy to not forget what it is that I'm using in this file. It's right there at the top. Anytime I wanna see kind of what, what functions are being used from where, the first thing I do is go to the top of the file and just look at all the import statements and boom, I can see them. 
So um, you just want to use curly braces to represent the object. That's the syntax here. And then uh, you include only the keys you need. So we know that this utils file, you know, might have like, you know, several different things in it, but I only need one in this case. So I'm like just extracting the one. And um, this is kind of, you know, how you, how you do that to, to say, I want to go to that object and I want to reach inside and just grab one or two things. That's kind of what you're doing here. So in this case, when I go to create my PyLite, all I have to do is say round to desk. I can refer to it directly by name, um, by whatever the key was in the object without actually having to, to do something like utils.round to desk, okay? So it's a bit much more straightforward. And honestly, in the real world, some of these functions that you're using from some of these libraries have really long names. And so to not have to use dot notation is a really great thing. Um, okay, so again, um, this is just grabbing, you know, tapping into the key directly by using this deconstruction syntax um, and completely bypassing uh, having to have an alias for the object. Okay, so let's, let's do it over in this example. So we're going to use deconstruction to do another import statement for utils, but this time we're going to just get the other two functions that are there. Um, and if we go over and check and say, okay, what are they? I'm going to need get random and I'm going to need get title case. I'm not going to use their original names because I have made the keys actually be, um, you know, aliases for these. And this is what uh, it's going to be able to find because it has to be part of this object. Even though we are reaching inside, we still have to refer to it by the keys. Okay. So get random, get title case. That's what I want. So I come back over here. Um, nope, wrong one. Let me go back to this file. Okay, and I can say const and then set up my um, brackets here, my curly braces, and say uh, round to num, comma, and then, uh, no, 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 wrong one, get <laughs> random, okay, I'm forgetting already, is it random? Yeah, get random, get title case, okay, comma, get title case, okay, and then, um, and, and you can see that it, you know, Replit's like, what are you doing? But I'm not done yet. And then I can say require and um, go to the same place. I'm gonna go to dot slash shared slash utils. Um, and now we have access to these directly, which is awesome. So I can just say, you know, console.log, uh, random integer between, um, one and 100. And then, you know, it's always a good idea to check and say, you know, what was the definition of this? How am I supposed to use it? So you go back to the original source and I could say, okay, it takes a max, a min and a number of decimals, but these have defaults. And if I only want an integer, then the only uh, parameter I really have to respond to is the max. So I can do that. Um, and again, I went to the wrong thing. Here we go. Here we are. All right. So I'm going to just say get random and I'm just going to give it 100. So I want one to 100 and we'll run it and we get 64. Okay, so this is, you know, this is nice. It's very straightforward. Um, okay, let's do one more thing. We're gonna uh, use deconstruction to import the question function from the read line sync library. So I'm gonna actually show you what this looks like with this particular syntax to do something you have actually already done just a little bit differently. And I'm gonna say require and uh, read line sync. Okay, so instead of having to have this alias input and use input.question, I'm saying, I just wanna go grab the question function directly. Like, um, you know, can I, can I just use that? Just like that. Um, so I will. So I'm going to first ask a user for their full name. So I'll say let name, let's say full name, full name, equal uh, question, and then um, say, what is your full name? Um, and then um, the second part is to print it in title case using the third function from utils. So I'll say console.log and um, I'll, I'll say uh, get title case, right? Get title case and then give it full name to process. All right. Let's run it. Okay, so what is your full name? Um, and I can, you know, be lazy and, you know, just kind of, 
like this. And it gives me a nicely capitalized, properly formatted, you know, Caroline Rose Jones. So, uh, so I had a couple different things going on there. You know, I did another import and I actually accessed the question function directly out of Readline Sync without having to have an alias for the entire library. And then I also, um, and that can have implications on your speed too, if you have a really, really big library you're working with um, and you're importing it into a lot of different files, it's better to only get what you actually need from it. Um, but yeah, and then I'm just asking the question and then I'm using this other one that I imported up here to process uh, that data and, and format it the way that I want it. Okay, um, so uh, I believe I forgot to put a question slide in here, but I, uh, who has questions? <laughs> I see Wesley, you've had your hand up. So I kind of have a two part question, but mm -hmm. in the first part, it seems like you would be able to export and import more than just functions. Is oh, yeah. it really just used for functions largely, or do you do that with variables and other things like yeah. arrays? Um, I would say most of the time you're using functions, but absolutely, like um, it's very common to store uh, lots of uh, like data, kind of kind of like um, in the contact file. I've got this data in contact and business hours. Let's say you did actually need those um, in several different places for a website and you just want to access them directly. Then I can come down here and I could actually change this to an object and you know add these in. So I have multiple key value pairs that include these. And yeah, they'd be accessible anywhere. I could have access to that data. That's very common. Um, and yes, you can uh, have things set as constants. Um, that might just be a single, it might just be a single value. Like let's say math.py didn't exist. You could have a value you know, stored somewhere in a shared file that was, you know, uh, constant, const pi equals 3.14, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then just import that wherever you needed it. Yeah. Cool. My, uh, the other part of my question was, um, if you, if you're creating a function that takes in other functions, you're going to have to export all of those functions, right? So would it be better practice to like have your most basic functions being imported and then the ones that are using those happen like an index in this case, or how is that usually? Um, well, that's the thing about, uh, that's the thing about using uh, deconstruction that's super useful is, like in this case, um, you know, I've only got two here, but there are definitely cases where I might, you know, want like, you know, five or six things all out of the same exact file. And I can do it this way, see them all named and just do it in a single line. Um, Cause you don't have to do them line by line. Um, and so if, if it was a situation like that, where I was using a bunch of custom defined functions uh, with it, with other functions, but honestly, um, most of the time when I'm using higher order functions, I'm using anonymous functions. I'm, I'm probably not feeding existing functions into them. Yeah. Anybody have any more questions? I have a question you might've answered earlier. I was a little late. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I was just wondering one of the I've seen import used similarly as the way you use require. And I'm just wondering if those are down to different versions or different systems, like one is node or. Um... Yeah, um, so uh, the, the import uh, keyword is uh, an ES6 thing. And um, in, the, in the really basic version, uh, oh, the basic way that um, programs are run with node in Replit, um, it doesn't include support for it, um, but in the when you are building something like a React or an Angular app or things like that, and, and you're and you've got you know fair use of all of the more modern JavaScript out there, um, import is the one everybody uses. Okay. So the only reason we're using require is just because Replit doesn't support it. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Any more? Okay, 
Um, we're going to do uh, one more example here. I've got, uh, this is where the spy graft comes in. Um, <laughs> I don't have like a huge, massive uh, pop culture reference tonight, but we are going to do some Morse code and that's kind of cool. So uh, I've got this exercise. This is actually from my website, um, but it ultimately was something that was in part um, suggested by uh, my own instructor at Launch Code when, uh, back in 2019 when I was a student. So I just kind of built on it and, and made it out, made it a, you know an, an interesting little example for modules. So we're going to write a function. Um, we're going to write three functions over in the Morse.js file. And um, we're gonna convert a single character to, mo to Morse code, convert a word to Morse code, and then convert an entire sentence to Morse code. So we'll do that with three different functions that kind of, you know, are essentially the first two are helper functions for the third one, right? Um, and then we're gonna export them from there, import them here, um, and we'll actually test out the, the helper functions before we use the, the final function to do some actual translating of like real phrases. Um, and then the bonus mission is to make it interactive, you know, use, use input.question to, um, you know, and, and loop through and, and, uh, you know, keep asking for things that the user might want translated. Okay. So we'll uh, get through this. Um, let's start, come back over to here and write these uh, for now, because we can't do anything without our functions. All right. So up at the top here, I've got an object called Morse map. Now that you guys know what objects are, this should look familiar. And it's got um, keys that are all the uh, letters of the alphabet, um, all the numbers, and a bunch of punctuation, like common punctuation, with their um, Morse code counterpart. So we're going to use this as an easy way to access the correct translation for each character that is in the phrase. Um, so that's our map. And we're going to use that down here. So let's uh, come to this first function. It says, um, write a function to convert a single character to Morse code, and then you're just gonna return that character. Okay. So we've got uh, translate you know, care, and we're just passing in a single character. So all I really have to do, actually, it's just, this is a one-liner. All I really have to do is return, and I'm just gonna go to the Morse map, and I'm gonna say care uh, to uppercase because I need to make sure if they give me something that has lowercase letters that it actually gets um, set to uppercase before I try to use it as a key because the only keys up here are uppercase. Um, and then uh, it just you know uses uh, this bracket notation here to give this as a variable um, and goes to the map and finds the correct one and returns it. All right, so that was simple enough. Um, and so then, uh, we can go over and actually test that here. So let's test it out. Um, we want to store a single character. Hold on. <laughs> got to make sure I've got um, the right stuff here. Yeah, OK. So let's um, store a, a single character in a variable called uh, care. Let's say let care equal w. And then I've got this variable translated we're gonna use multiple times. This time I'm gonna uh, set it um, to take the value Morse. Oh, I have to import, I haven't imported. See, I'm trying to use my functions and I forgot to import guys. Okay. <laughs> so I can go up here and actually set this const Morse. And I'm just gonna call that, that's gonna be my um, alias for the entire object that's being exported out of the Morse file. Okay. And I can leave off the JS if I want to. I can just do it like this. That's fine. Um, kind of do it either way. So uh, now translated equals Morse dot. And I'm going to call my um, translate. I have to go look at it. Translate care. Yeah. And give it this character that I just created, this W. Um, all right. So now. Um, I'm going to call the function. Uh, I call the function. I pass in the thing, and so now we have values for both the character and the translation that can be printed with this. And in order for this to work, um, I'm going to console log these out so we can test this. That's not a function. What did I do? Oh, I forgot to export it. You guys, I'm doing things all out of order. So if these things happen to you, this is why. Okay. Uh, all right. Have to export before you can import. 
So I'm going to say modules.export. And for now, I, I know I'm going to have three things. So I'm going to go ahead and create the object. And for now, I'm just going to put the one that I've written in um, that actually has a proper uh, definition. OK, so we've got it in there. Let's run it. Mod oh, I did this wrong. Module, it's module singular dot export, exports plural. Easy mistake to make. OK. All right, so we have here, you know, here are a few examples. In Morse code, the letter W is, and then it translated it. So our initial little function here, this helper function to just translate a single, single character is working just fine. Um, so now we go over to um, this one, and we're gonna say, uh, write an algorithm to actually return an entire word. So to do this, we really just need to look at it, a word, a letter at a time, right? So if we pass in a word, we're going to start off with um, something that we're. Gonna, this is a, you know, kind of one of your typical um, accumulator patterns where you start off with something that you're going to build. So we'll start off with trans, let translated word, and it'll be an empty string, and then we'll loop through. And I'm just going to say, you know, i equals zero, i is less than word dot length, to loop through this string one character at a time. And then I will just add to a translated word. We can um, uh, translate, translated, this should be translated. I knew I had a problem. There we go. All right, translated word uh, plus equals, and we will call our other function to translate just a single character from that word, uh, whichever character is at index I of the word. And then I'm going to add a space. Okay. Um, so we'll just build our words this way. Um, and after it's looped through, um, oh, so here's something though, to make this a little bit more resilient, um, I'm actually gonna make sure that it's actually a character in the map because it's always possible that there's a, a character that doesn't exist um, in the map. So let's, let's make sure we are, I, yeah. I'm using um, I'm using some syntax you haven't seen before, but um, there's a way for you to actually check for a way a way to check and see if a key exists in um, an object by using this end keyword. If that key exists in in the object, then and we then we can actually. Add it. Otherwise, we're not going to do anything. And then we'll just keep going through letter by letter. And then eventually we'll be able to return the translated word complete. Okay. So let's go test that one. I'm going to need to export it, of course. So I'll say uh, translate word and give it the same name. And then over here, um, I already have the object, the full object represented. So it's just a matter of using it. Okay, so I'm going to uh, store a single word in a new variable word. So I'll say let word equal, and we'll call it uh, specialty. And then um, I'm gonna give translated a new value. And this time I'm calling um, translate word and I'll give it um, word. Okay. And then I'll undo this and we'll run it. There we go. In Morse code, the word specialty is, and then it gives us the entire word letter by letter. Awesome. Okay. So the last bit is to make it possible to translate an entire phrase of multiple words. So we'll come back over here and write this one. Um, and I believe, yeah, we're just gonna do this with a series of string methods. Um, so the, the thing to remember here is that the phrase is gonna come in as a string, but we're gonna wanna work with it word by word. And so the way to do that is to split it. So I'm gonna say, let phrase array and call it what it's going to be because I'm about to split this phrase into an array. And I'm gonna split it on spaces. We're just gonna assume a space is what separates all the individual words. Um, and then I can, do my accumulation pattern and say, you know, let translated phrase equal empty string. 
Um, and then we can actually go through and build this a little bit at a time. Okay. So for let i equals zero, i is less than phrase array dot length. Now that we have the words all split out, we'll increment each time. Okay, so we'll go through each one at a time and then we will just build this phrase uh, by adding to it and calling translate word, uh, the previous function we wrote and just give it um, phrase array at index i. Um, Yes. And then the last thing I want to do is actually have the divider um, that we put on, uh, that we put between each word to make it clear where one word uh, ends and the other begins. And you'll notice I don't have a space in front of this. And that's because I'm adding spaces after each word, um, after each character already. So we really don't need an extra one. This, the, the bar will do the job. Okay. And then we'll just return our translated phrase. All right, so let's export it. All. Okay. Uh, and then we'll come back over to index and we'll do this one. All right, so. Uh, the phrase that I have is uh, phrase equal, damn it, Jim. I'm about to have a problem if I don't use a regular hyphen. Okay, I'm uh, a doctor, not a coder. Okay, and then um, we'll actually update this translated thing again and just say Morse dot translate all and give it phrase. Okay. Um, and then print out our little statement. There you go. Now we have an entire um, phrase that is done word by word. And you can see these, you know, pipes, um, you know, separating them. So it's more easily readable. Um, not that reading is what you usually do with Morse code, but this is the best we can do with code, right? Um, Okay, so uh, anybody have any questions about what I've done so far? All right, we're gonna do the bonus mission, uh, which is to make this interactive. So uh, we wanna accept user input. Um, so we, I've already got that part here. I've just done the usual you know, input. It's what you're familiar with. Um, and then uh, we'll just have a little bit of intro text. So I'm just going to say, you know, console.log, your turn, enter text to translate or quit when you're done. Okay. Um, and then we want to uh, make this um, an endless loop unless they say quit. So this is where we use a while loop, right? Um, here's the thing, a uh, little trick for you guys. You can set up a variable to like be a Boolean that's like, you know, you know, ready to quit or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then you can like track that or whatever. You can also just use the break keyword to just break out of the loop whenever you want, if it's a simple enough loop and this will be. Uh, so if you're going to do it that way and just use the break, uh, keyword, you can just say while true so that you just set the loop up to just run until you break out of it. Um, little tip. Uh, so sometimes you don't really, this is simple enough. I don't really need to like create a whole nother variable just to track uh, a, a Boolean. Um, so I'm just gonna say, uh, let phrase equal, and then I'll do my input.question to get what I want from the user. So I'm gonna say, um, what would you like to translate uh, into Morse code? Okay, so we're getting our phrase. Um, and then of course we uh, need to check to make sure they're not giving us quit. Um, so we have a way to break our loop. So if phrase dot to uppercase, nope, <laughs> there we go. If phrase dot to uppercase is quit, um, then we would say, you know, um, some sort of exit statement, right? Like. 
thanks for trying out the translator. Goodbye. Um, and then we break um, to break the loop. Otherwise, we can just print the translation. So we just go to morse.translate all, give it the phrase. No, there we go. And we just keep going. And I mean, that's it. There's no need for a return statement uh, in this function because it's just, you know, accomplishing things. So let's um, do it. Okay, so uh, your turn, enter uh, text. What would you like to translate? Um, well, if I'm gonna be a spy, I'm gonna say like, you know, the crow flies at midnight or something. There we go. All right, uh, does anybody else have anything they would like me to translate? <laughs> um, shaken, not stirred. Good, shaken, not stirred. There it is. <laughs> May the force be with you. The Jedi eagle eyes. has left the nest. What was the last one? The eagle has left the nest. Eagle has left the nest. I love it. Okay. Cool. Okay. So yeah. So it's interactive. And so until I actually say quit, and let's just test our two uppercase. I'm going to do lowercase. There we go. Okay. It converted it to uppercase quit before it, before I uh, compared it. So yeah. Um, that is a quick way to make a little interactive program. Um, that uses you know modules it uses objects you know we made really good use of this map here to, to for the translations uh so lots of uh lots of fun little uh things here um does anybody have any last questions about this um before we move on nope okay all right so um, the last thing I want to do, we're not taking a break because we're almost done and I'm going to send you guys off to studio. Um, the last thing I want to do here is just talk a little bit about uh, my own little journey into this because um, it's been it's been a little bit of a wild ride for me, um, but I was hoping it would be encouraging for you to just kind of hear. So I was actually in... Um, when I was a student, one of the things that um, our CEM like asked everybody, it was like becoming really obvious that everybody was really, really stressed out. And so he posted this thing and just said, okay, what are some of the fears that you're facing right now? Like what, where's your anxiety coming from? And also like, what are your motivations? Like, what is it that inspires you? Why are you here? And people were saying things like some of the fears and anxieties were like, you know, getting further behind. It's just, you know, then it was just more stressful. It's more overwhelming and I'm already overwhelmed. Um, I'm worried that I'm going to, you know, not be able to retain all the stuff that I'm learning because I'm learning so much. Um, you know, I, I don't know that when it comes time for me to, you know, go get a job, I'm going to be able to articulate all of this stuff or demonstrate it, you know, to people who know more than I do. Um, and, you know, change itself is scary. This is going to bring a lot of change in my life. Um, and they also were saying, you know, change can be exciting. It's good to have a challenge. Um, I love to learn new things. Uh, change is necessary. Like I was in a dead end job and, you know, no room to learn and grow. And that was exactly true for me, for sure. Uh, or just my financial needs, you know, I need to be able to make more money than I make right now. Um, some people said, you know, they were doing it for their family as it, being a role model to their kids. Like they had lots of reasons for why they decided to do this very difficult course. Um, so everybody's personal story is a little bit different. Um, and, and here's a little bit of mine. Um, the for no um i gotta do the math seven years ago um i was about to apply for new jobs i was a grant writer for a nonprofit, and i was unhappy because i wasn't learning and growing and learning you know new things and wasn't particularly happy at that particular organization um and i was i literally had a list of jobs that i was about to apply for that i had researched and then i was diagnosed with cancer and i was like oh okay so i can't get a new job right now i'm gonna just have to stick it out um and initially I was a little surprised at the way that I handled the news because I actually didn't fall apart. Um, like I just kind of thought about it and I was like, huh, like why, why do I feel like this is not like a huge, horrible, horrible thing? I mean, it was, but like, I've, I've been through a lot in my life and I think I, I, I can do this. Like I just immediately kind of did a little bit of self-talk. <laughs> it's like, 
you can do this. It's going to be hard. And it did get really, really hard. Um, and I remember I was driving home from work one day um, and like about halfway through chemo probably. And um, I just was like, man, like, I don't, I understand now why people say that you fight cancer um, because it is exhausting. And I, I don't want to fight to just not die. <laughs> Like I want to fight to live and, and I need to decide what that's going to look like. And, you know, uh, but it's also, this, this is taking a long time. I mean, even after chemo for a good year and a half, I had pretty significant cognitive impairments. I was, I would, I had knew by then, cause I'd been thinking about what do I want to do with my life now? You know, cause I, I know, I just, I just know I don't want to do what I was doing before. And I was like, I've always loved, you know, computers and web stuff. And I, I really would love to learn to code for real. Um, but I was worried that I was not going to be able to use my brain again. And uh, that was a major blow to my confidence. It was very scary, not knowing if my brain was gonna come back. So it did take about a year, a year and a half. And that was just in time. I found out about launch code and was able to apply like right as that was happening. Um, and cancer really changed me. Like, you know, there's obviously some neg negative things but there's some positive things that came out of it too. Like, I don't take shit from anybody, <laughs> like in a good way. Like I stand up for myself and I, you know, I, I don't let things knock me down. I can handle conflict really well. I can have a reasonable conversation and not get completely torn out, up about it and not, you know, fear it so much that I just like avoid it. I can walk in and do it. Um, I am, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you guys secret and you're not going to believe me, but I'm an introvert with social anxiety, like seriously. And something about going through everything I went through with cancer and everything. Like I just got a lot better at overcoming it. And I psyched myself up to start going to the launch code headquarters two days a week in person and do this massive class with people and be around people all the time. And that helped me grow. And, um, you know, and now I'm up here teaching you guys, like, what, what is that about? So said all that to say, like, you can grow and you can overcome these things. Um, but yeah, but, but cancer did make a big difference. Um, and yeah, I mean, then, and then of course I've now for the past three years, I've, you know, gone through, you know, different jobs, different positions, learning new things and all of that. I'm currently looking for a new job and that's proving to be very um, difficult. And uh, so, yeah, it's, you know, there are ups and downs. There are constant, constant ways in which you feel like you're being stretched and it gets really hard to um, you know, just keep pushing forward when you feel like you're struggling so much. Um, so here are some things to consider when you are struggling, um, or, you know, completely freaking out kind of depending at what stage you're at. Right. Um, it's important for you to be honest about how you're feeling. Uh, how is it, how is it affecting your life and your relationships? You got to pay attention to yourself, stay, stay in tune. Um, and also just get really comfortable with discomfort <laughs> because the learning curve, which, um, you know, is already intense for you guys and is going to get more intense, um, sorry to say, uh, it's painful, right? Learning curves that are painful. Um, you have to keep pushing through. The only way, you know, past is through. Um, you're gonna just have to get accustomed to those growing pains. And then you have to recognize, I think that some fears are legitimate. Like, yeah, the way you're feeling, the, the fears that you have, they're legitimate, but some of them are lies. Like sometimes you have to be able to tell the difference so that you can just go, oh, you know what? I've, I've been sitting here believing that, but that is not true. And then, you know, um, but, but either way, those fears that whether they're legit or lies, they can get in the way of moving forward. So you have to kind of, um, you know, figure out how to, to deal with that. And everyone here is making a sacrifice on some level. It's difficult to manage your real life and this class at the same time, assuredly. Um, but it's only for a short while. And so it helps to keep that in mind that, you know, you're going to get through this just a few months. Um, so be kind to yourself, you know, set reasonable expectations, measured goals um, for where you are. And I think, um, you know, just keep remembering that who you were yesterday is not who you are today. Um, don't get hung up on the past. Um, I think sometimes we can um, think of ourselves about maybe this is the way I used to do life or the way I used to think of myself. Um, and if we get stuck in that, it gives us no room for growth. So instead, you know, ask yourself, who do I want to be? Like, that was kind of where I was. I was like, I want to be someone different. Who, who is that? Who, you know, where am I going? And then just be inspired by that person that you are becoming because you are going to be changing and growing through this process um, on some level. 
And then just be really intentional, um, you know, about supporting each other, um, you know, taking advantage of this amazing community here at Launch Code and within this cohort, um, both online and offline. And you know, talk it out. Um, if you if you're struggling, talk to somebody, family, friends, therapist, whoever you knows will listen, give you good support. But just don't not talk about it because then you're just going to you know like implode. Um, and ultimately, talk to yourself. You got to remind yourself what's true, uh, what's good and what motivates you. Um, and just kind of take a deep breath and keep holding on to those things, right? Um, and, and be proud of yourself because you have already taken a huge step getting here and getting this far and you are going to, um, you're gonna get there. You're gonna you know, keep, keep sticking it out and putting in the work. And um, yeah, it's, it's, you're, you're gonna be amazed just even in a few weeks, but especially in like six months, you're gonna be amazed at how much you've learned. Like, you'll just go back and go, whoa, like how did I cram all of that information in my brain? And I now know how to use it and explain it. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I you know, just encourage you guys um, as you get into studio tonight, um, you know, there's lots of good questions, lots of good prompts in the book, just you know, talk about it um, together. and be encouraged by each other. Everyone has these little stories and you have um, you know, things that you can hear from each other and it'll hit a little different, right? Okay, so um, more practice on the website with, uh, you've already seen the Morse code one, but there's a geometry one and there's a few others that are there for examples um, that are pretty advanced, but uh, you can look at that. Um, again, there are a couple of these big um, recorded uh, tutorial sessions I did with students when I was a TA. One's physician directory, the other's catering menu. These will help you prepare for graded assignment two. And what's coming down the pike? Okay, um, you've got catch up class on Thursday. Um, you've got no class on Monday. And then after that, we're gonna talk about unit testing the following Thursday. And then on class 10, we'll be talking about scope types and exceptions. Um, and yeah, lots of good stuff coming down the pike, guys. Uh, so let's get you off to studio. Um, Tonight's uh, studio, chapter 13, boosting confidence. So no coding, but if you do need help with something, when you get done with your discussion, if there's still time left, and there probably will be, because you've got two hours, um, you know, you could always ask to go into like a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, to look at it, to look at your graded assignment or whatever you guys want to do. Um, just ask your TAs for help, use that time. All right. Anybody got any last questions? Thank you, Carrie. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. You're awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie.